What is going on everybody? Welcome to the conversation on TYT. I am your sometimes host Francesca Fiorentini. I hope you're very good and very safe. I'm excited for these conversations ahead. My first guests have written a book together. Graham Maxton is the author and former Secretary General of the Club of Rome. And Bernice Maxton Lee is a lecturer and former director of the Jane Goodall Institute. And they've written a book called A Chicken Can't Lay a Duck Egg. Welcome Graham and Bernice to the conversation. Um, this book, I I wanna, you're welcome, I wanna get talk about the title, but the book is about how um, despite all the awfulness of COVID-19, um, there might be a silver lining and a lesson when it comes to how we go forward in tackling climate change. Um, explain how this moment can be instructional for us when it comes to reigning in climate change. Okay, so, so the title from the book is actually from the words of Malcolm X, the uh, the black civil rights activist from the 1960s and 70s. I heard and what, he, what he meant when he said this is that uh, a chicken can't lay a duck egg. A system is designed to do one thing and it can't do something else. Yeah. And what we mean by it is that the system, the economic system, the political system, the social system that we have today can't solve climate change because it's designed to do something else. It's designed to maximize the profits and short term earnings for a, a small group of people. And so it can't fix climate change, it can't fix our environmental problems. We need a different system. So a chicken can't lay a duck egg. We need a different economic system if we're going to solve our e ecological challenges. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the, that's, that's, that's the story behind it. And, and, and we're saying that COVID-19, because it's created so much disruption, so much economic and social disruption, we're saying now is a really good chance. We have the best chance we've had in decades of creating that sort of big change that we need. Yeah. Bernice, how, how do you go about um, you know, explaining the link between you know, some of the lessons we're learning now and the lessons that we could be learning and applying to climate change? Well, yeah, that's a really good question. So, I mean, for a long time, the things that we were saying needed to happen to stop climate change, um, people said were, you know, nice but impossible, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then along came COVID-19, and a lot of the things that we've been saying that needed to happen, like shutting down a lot of production and uh, sending people home uh, and paying them not to work and uh, stopping people from flying, lo and behold, that started happening. And mm -hmm. so it became clear that, huh, actually these things are possible. So we're saying that actually we've made a really great head start. So let's use that momentum and, and uh, do more. Yeah, absolutely. I was reading a recent study that said that there's like been a 7% drop in global emissions um, and that Yet, uh, if we were to be on track with, you know, the Paris Climate Accord, which is, of course, incredibly uh, a low of a bar, but still we have to get there, that we'd have to keep on reducing our emissions by seven percent every single year for the next decade. Um, and as someone who's, you know, itching to go outside and meet with people and see people and drive places, you know. Um, it's worrisome because I'm like, wait a minute, what does this mean? Are we all gonna have to be inside for the rest of our lives? What What is your response and what do you lay out in the book uh, in terms of um, whether we're gonna have to just be indoors as a way to stop climate change? I'm sure that's not what you're arguing, but yeah. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> no, I mean, this, I mean, you're quite right. I mean, emissions went down 7% last year and they need to go down 7% every year now. And that's a big, a big ask. Uh, but let's not forget also that the concentration is still going up. I mean, we're still releasing far too many greenhouse gases. And so the situation, the climate change situation is getting worse. Yeah. It's just that it's getting less, you know, slower. It's getting worse more slowly than it was before. Right. What we're saying is we need to go back to something more like life was in the 1970s. We need to go back to a simpler life where we're not consuming so much, we're not using so much energy, we're not going you know, off to the Seychelles for our holidays or Mexico or wherever we're going. We're right. traveling less and living more simply, but you know, with different values. We, we, we think about the world slightly differently and we can enjoy it in different ways. Yeah, if I can just jump in that, you know, it's, it's also not just about the decisions that we make as consumers. It's not about us as individuals like staying in our homes. It's actually about uh, producers not producing so much stuff. So this this also needs to be much, much bigger than us as individuals, right? Yeah, 
Absolutely. I mean, it, it's sort of the um, the framework that I think the UN has uh, has taken or hasn't really taken up, which is we need to pay uh, countries in the global south to not emit, to not tear down the rainforest. That there is, should be an incentive, like you're saying, uh, stay home. Here is money to stay home, which. You know, here in the US, you know, our government is not even doing a great job of, of helping us stay home um, to prevent the spread of this virus. Um, you know, I, I want to talk about that systemic change versus reform. Uh, I think that I'm in total agreement with you um, that, especially under capitalism, it's like you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet, as they say. It is completely antithetical um, to keep growing GDPs and try and live on this planet that gets hotter and hotter and hotter. But there are steps, right? And and how I think the Green New Deal is a great example of that. But how would you see um, governments being able to seize on this moment to push forward things like a Green New Deal, things like um, you know moving along to renewables, um, massive investment in in that kind of green technology? What are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, so far governments have failed us completely here. I mean. We've been talking about climate change for for you know 30, 40 years now, and and we've done nothing really. I mean, the situation is getting worse all the time. And what we're saying in the book is that we actually need to reclaim democracy. That the democracy has been hijacked by a bunch of a bunch of people who are looking after themselves and a bunch of people who are funded by corporates, uh, and they're not doing what's necessary. And we need we need to put people elect people who are actually going to take the steps that are needed to radically downsize our economies and, and shift the way we live. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I would also add to that that we need to stop thinking about environmental issues and you know, climate change as uh, you know in silos. We need to stop that being pushed into the green discussion. And we need to make sure that that goes across all issues. So across social, across infrastructure, across health, um, because we're seeing a lot of confusion, um, and I use that term. Yeah, with, I'm, I'm trying to be kind here. Um, <laughs> we see a lot of confusion in policy coming out. Like, an example is the UK, which is hosting uh, COP26 this year, uh, the big climate change meeting. Yes. And yet, at the same time, they have plans for a building a third runway at Heathrow, uh, the country's biggest airport, and they have plans to build a new deep coal mine. So there's clearly a disconnect in that logic. Somebody's making some decisions uh, in one, on one side of the room um, that are not translating across to that discussion on the other side. Absolutely, yeah, I think that, yes, once again, I mean, the Greta Thunberg is just resounding in my head that we need a radical shift and here you, you've seen it in COVID. And I mean, one of, one of the things that I think we're gonna have to talk about is how we actually confront um, these major industries like the airline industry, um, like uh, the automobile industry that are all dependent on fossil fuels, which as we all know, I, I feel like there was a sort of an idea that was like, oh, well, well oil is gonna just get too expensive because the scarcity <laughs> is gonna mean that it's too expensive. Well, it's cheaper than ever. You know, so this is not the market is not helping us in this moment right now. Um, but anyway, what are your thoughts on that? Is it is it elect the politicians that are willing to stand up to those in, industries, or um, will they come around because green technology is profitable at some point? I don't. Know, what are your What are your thoughts on that, uh, Graham? Yeah, right. So I think we need to we need to interrupt the life cycle of this thought process. That uh, you know, just like some messiah, some some hero is going to come along and save us all. That the market is going to come along and save us all. It's not. I'm really sorry to be the bearer of that news, but it's really not. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we have to have a major mind shift. Yeah, absolutely. The market can't solve this, and nor can technology. I mean, the the problem that we've got here is our mentality. We keep thinking we need growth. We keep thinking we need to travel and live the way we do, and we don't. We need to change what we're, the way we live, and then we can solve this problem. It's not a technological problem; it's a it's a political, social problem, and that's what we have to address. Just really quickly, personally, um, what how are you coming away from this pandemic? Um, in terms of, and I know it's more than our own lifestyles, but how? How do we need to reframe how we think about even, yeah, the ways that we travel, the ways that we consume? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, the pandemic offers us a chance to re reset the, the, the way we live. I mean, we're living in a very strange situation here. We're in Taiwan where there is no coronavirus and we have no lockdown. And so our life is still as normal, but we're looking like almost from another universe. Oh and we God. can see terrible suffering in, in, mm -hmm. in the US and Europe. But we also want to be waking people up so that they understand that this is an opportunity. It may be terrible right now, but we have the chance to change the way we think and change the way we behave. Yeah, I would add to that that, uh, you know, looking f from the outside in almost at the way that different governments around the world are responding to this, we would really like to awaken the empathy mm. in leadership, you know, and start thinking not about the economy, but about the people, about the lives. Yeah, Sorry. absolutely. We're in that moment of. Yeah. In the US, just electing a president who finally is acknowledging the massive uh, casualties under COVID-19. And of course, the massive casualties under climate change. Um, hopefully he'll acknowledge that and do something about it. Uh, Bernice Maxton Lee and Graham Maxton, uh, they've just authored a book, The Chicken. A chicken can't lay a duck egg, um, all about how this moment can teach us the way forward to solving and stopping climate change once and for all. Thank you both for joining me. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, I really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.